Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to all of you for another Reclone Community Meeting. It's exciting to have uh, these gatherings once a month to talk about exciting research topics around our community with people from all over the world, uh, especially today uh, from Australia. So joining us at a not so friendly time. Uh, so thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Professor Q. And I'll pass to Aaron to briefly introduce you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sibeli. So good day, good evening, uh, everyone. So I'm proud to um, introduce to you our speaker for today, Professor Kirill Alexandro. So um, Professor Kirill obtained his master's degree in invertebrate zoology at Leningrad State University, Russia in 1989 and completed his uh, PhD in cell biology at EMBL Heidelberg, Germany in 1995. Um, he went on to postgraduate work at uh, the Department of Physical Biochemistry at the Max Planck Institute in Germany and remained there for 12 years. He be and becoming a group leader in 1999. Um, he joined the Institute for Molecular Bioscience of the University of Queensland, Australia in 2008 as an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Um, in 2018, he became the inaugural professor of synthetic biology at Queensland University of Technology. He then co-founded the German biotechnology company, Jenna Bioscience in 1998, and the UK-Australian Synbio company, Molecular Warehouse in 2015. Um, his group is interested in protein uh, engineering technologies, in vitro protein synthesis and artificial sensing and signal transduction. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Professor Kirill now. Uh, for him to tell you a little bit more about a uh, Leishmania-based selfie protein expression. So whenever you're ready, um, we can start. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to speak and, and the introduction. So I will be talking today about an enabling protein research tool that uh, uh, we've been developing for about slightly over 10 years. Uh, and, you know, that really came out of, from our early interest in protein structure, protein crystallography, protein biochemistry. And uh, as you imagine, all these uh, uh, disciplines require the ability to engineer and produce recombinant proteins. And of course, uh, as uh, pretty much everyone in the field, we encountered some challenges. And uh, that was uh, one of the reasons why, well, that we embarked on uh, developing alternative protein expression systems and came across uh, the Lishmania organism. So let me share my screen. Uh, so we, uh, I can, I can actually show you the, uh, the um, slides. So, uh, pop, 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 sorry. So you you can see my you can see my slides, right? Ah, yes, we can see. It. Yes. Okay. Right. So so the I'll be talking about Lishmania based cell free protein expression system, and uh, so before I get to that particular system, I'll talk a little bit about what uh, cell uh, protein expression is and what uh, cell free protein expression is. So. So there are basically two ways of making recombinant proteins. You know there are in vivo protein production and in vivo in vitro protein production. In 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 vivo protein production, you take a host and then you inject into it through various methods a, a, a piece of DNA or RNA that uh, captures the transcription translational machinery and makes the host to produce uh, synthesize the uh, protein of interest. Uh, the situation is slightly different in the vitro protein production where uh, you take a host and then you basically strip it down and you throw away everything which is not directly related uh, to protein biosynthesis. And then you reprogram that remaining uh, mixture with DNA or RNA and then make it produce a recombinant protein. So you're using the residual uh, uh, protein biosynthetic activity of protein lysis. So, so in, in the way the way it's typically done, you uh, we normally most of the systems are based on 
culturable organisms, uh, exceptions being the wheat germ, which is uh, uses as an input uh, grains of wheat. wheat. Uh, and then you take the take the organism of choice and you just blend it or you know, homogenize it using various methods. And you get rid of uh, everything that you, you can get rid of by centrifugation. And then you end up with this uh, soup where you, you have uh, components of biosynthetic machinery, such as ribosomes, tRNA, translational, uh, translation initiation and ligation factors, and some other activities. And then you resupply the system with energy and with nucleotides uh, and with uh, uh, energy regeneration systems and amino acids. And and the the DNA and so the system goes and uh, starts synthesizing proteins. So the re, so the why uh, what advantages the uh, cell free systems have over the in vivo living systems? Uh, one of the main advantages that uh, uh, gene manipulation of living organisms often results in changes in their viability and changes of their biochemistry. And so this is definitely not the case uh, in case of uh, cell-free systems because, you know, you cannot kill cell-free system because the organism is already dead. And uh, this is, uh, these are open systems that you can add there pretty much anything. Uh, and you can also withdraw components, uh, which is very difficult to do with in vivo systems. So... That is big, one big advantage, the openness of the system. The second big advantage is that you can operate over a very large range of scales. You know, the, uh, the, in extreme examples, uh, cell-free systems are operated on 100-liter uh, scales. Uh, and, you know, they also operate it on pike-liter scales and in nanodrops. Uh, so, and, and so that essentially... You can view protein, uh, in vitro protein expression systems as protein polymerases. You can treat them as reagents. So another uh, significant advantage that you, if you're constructing a recombinant host, even if you're using the host like uh, E. coli, it still takes you days uh, uh, to, to go from the expression vector to a recombinant proteins. While in case of self, uh, self systems, you know, you typically get protein within within a couple of hours. So there is a this element of ability to multiplex and ability to produce proteins rapidly and on demand. And the it it is an old technology and it dates back to the 60s. You know, it actually was first time was used uh, in discovery of genetic code, and. Uh, since then, a uh, number of expression systems were produced, and they are, they are roughly, oh, sorry, I just go back, roughly can be divide, uh, divided into uh, eukaryotic cell free systems, you know, that is uh, uh, exemplified by E. coli, and then, uh, oh, sorry, prokaryotic expression systems and uh, exemplified by E. coli, and the eukaryotic systems that most noticeable examples are wheat germ, insect cells rabbit reticulocyte lysate, and now there's a few other systems like plant-based Alice system based on the tobacco, uh, the HeLa system based on HeLa cells, and uh, a system that we introduced, Lishmania tarantula based system. So what is Lishmania tarantula? Lishmania tarantula is a, a parasitic protozoan, which uh, it's actually a parasite of lizards that was um, isolated into culture in 1930s and uh, lived happily there ever since. And we picked this organism for several reasons, some being microbiological, because it's easy, it's, it's easy to grow it on simple right. medias. Uh, medias, uh, you can grow them on terrific broth, which is uh, one of the uh, bacterial uh, uh, cultivation medias. Uh, but also, you know, it's uh, it it has several features of its molecular biology that makes it easy uh, to make cell-free uh, protein expression system. And the way it's done, you cultivate the Lishmania tarantula, this flagellated organism, and then you uh, disrupt disrupted by what is called nitrogen cavitation by an uh, uh, 
change, uh, rapid change in, in pressure that uh, bursts the cells. And then you centrifuge it to, to, to pellet the, the membranes and, polis and polisomes. And then there's a step uh, uh, where you add uh, anti-sense oligonucleotide to suppress translation of, of endogenous mRNA. And you know I won't go into the details, but uh, the way the genome is structured in these organisms allows for this process to be very efficient. And finally, you end up with this reagent that you can then prime with either RNA or DNA. In case of uh, DNA, it's a so-called coupled system where DNA is uh, transcribed into RNA and then RNA is translated to protein. And within two, three hours, you get your output protein. Now, when you create a technology, it's very important to ask a question. So how does this technology relate to all other existing technologies? Because uh, that will determine uh, its utility and uh, uh, also uh, justify its, its further development, should there be any. So we uh, performed a couple of years ago a benchmarking of cell-free uh, uh, Lishmania uh, translation system uh, against other systems. And uh, to do that, we created a vector, uh, which we called a PM cell-free vector. Uh, uh, and that, that vector has um, a T7 promoter. It has what is called TIT, you know, that's... Uh, sequence that we designed, which called uh, Species Independent Translation Initiation Sequence, and then the gene of interest. Uh, and that uh, Vectra uh, can be, can drive uh, exp protein expression in any cell-free systems, whether prokaryotic or eukaryotic, due, due to this uh, uh, seed sequence. But it also can, can be used to express proteins in mammalian cells, and we use the systems interchangeably. Um, the uh, uh, it was designed to be compatible with the gateway cloning, uh, and that was important when we were preparing our benchmarking study uh, because we picked ninety uh, human open reading frames from the gate uh, vector collection, uh, and those proteins were chosen based on their uh, several parameters. They were uh, chosen based on their popularity, how often they're, they're mentioned in the Google search, and they also were chosen by size. So, so we had uh, uh, proteins ranging in size from, uh, from 30 to 150 kilodalton. And so we in, in, in expressed this collection in several uh, cell-free systems, including Lishmania. And so that was uh, the, uh, just an example of us expressing the uh, uh, a set of large proteins, of which are in around 150 kilodalton. They are GFP tagged, and they they are in uh, expressing E. coli, wheat germ expression system, HeLa, and uh, Lishmania tarantula system. And so what you're looking at here at is a uh, uh, SDSP gels loaded with uh, uh, translation mixtures and then imaged for fluorescence because if you don't boil uh, the samples before loading, then uh, GFP retains this fluorescence and you actually uh, can identify the protein on the gel. And so what you see here, you see that in the coli system, you get a lot of tr uh, truncation products uh, that uh, uh, this big protein is actually broken down and there is this, all these fragments, while the eukaryotic systems are, uh, perform much better and give you much more homogeneous products. Uh, and uh, uh, so you, we, if you look at across this uh, set of, uh, of this, uh, the, 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 pro the protein set, so what you see, so this is color-coded, where we're going here from low molecular weight to high molecular weight, and the uh, uh, we're going from blue high integrity to red low integrity. And you, you see it very clearly uh, that uh, the prokaryotic coli system performs 
uh, uh, badly and particularly uh, particularly badly when it comes to large proteins. And at the, when proteins become particularly large, you know, then even eukaryotic systems such as wheat germ starts having difficulties, and uh, Leishmania and Hela perform comparatively. Comparably, we also uh, uh, performed another analysis because our proteins were tagged with fluorescent proteins. We used a single molecule spectroscopy uh, uh, to look at the um, uh, where we focus a, a confocal microscope in a small volume, and then we measure uh, the diffusion times of uh, fluorescently tagged proteins for this volume, which allows us to assess their um, uh, the more uh, their, their dispersity, so how where the molecules diffuse through the volume as single molecules or their aggregates or their dimers and so on. And so, so this data uh, was summarized and I'm not going to dwell on it. And so that is uh, looking at the aggregation propensity of the proteins in different uh, cell-free systems. And again, you know, the blue is good, red is bad. Uh, you see that small proteins are more are more likely to be more dispersed in uh, eukaryotic systems. They're not doing uh, terribly well. Only 20% of the protein are more, more dispersed in E. coli. Uh, uh, and things get worse when uh, when the protein becomes large. Uh, nonetheless, you know, the, the Leishmania system was able to express 70% of um, our test uh, mammalian or human proteins in the more dispersed form, which is a good number. So, um, right, so so basically we had the system which allowed us to rapidly produce fairly complex mammalian uh, or uh, eukaryotic proteins. And so I'll show now you a couple of applications where, and further developments of the technology uh, for, uh, for, for various uh, protein engineering and, and biochemical application. So one bit of technology that we developed was uh, coupling the in vitro protein expression. Oh, sorry, there is a thunderstorm coming through, so there might be some background noise. Um, coupling the expression to an intra uh, interaction assay where we express, co-express proteins, like protein A and protein B with two different fluorescent tags with GFP and with uh, red fluorescent protein cherry. And then we use antibody uh, against GFP or against cherry attached to beads of what is known as alpha lysa system. It's a, a bead proximity assay produced by Perkin Elmer, uh, which allows transfer of uh, single oxygen and activation of beads that are in proximity of each other. So if the beads are brought in proximity, you get a luminescent signal which you can uh, detect using a uh, play treater. And so the, the way we do the experiments, we do translation, uh, in the translation in 20 microliter volume and 384 well plates. We dilute it about 100 times. And then we, we use the uh, perform assays again in 384 uh, well plates and read it on the play treater. And so that gives you a... Uh, uh, matrices of pro pro uh, protein interactions. And so I'll exemplify this uh, on uh, analysis of the Zika virus, you know, which uh, which is a virus which was a significant uh, public health concern a couple of years ago. And what was not known, only partially known at the time, uh, how the open reading frames that are uh, coded by Zika virus genome. And so there is a pol polyprotein that is then uh, cleaved into different bits. You know, how this uh, individual proteins coded by Zika virus genome interact with each other. And so to do that, we produce all of the uh, Zika virus uh, uh, proteins in cell free, tag them with both green and red fluorescent protein. You know, this is a SDS PHL where you can, in red, you see the uh, uh, one co expressed one of the proteins, and then the rest, the rest of them were expressed as uh, GFP tag proteins. 
um, and that performed the analysis. And what you end up, you end up with a matrix of all possible combinations of proteins and, and their, their, their interactions, which allowed us to build this map of uh, interviral interactions. Uh, and so that's the map that we generated. And so that, um, and that's actually the, the map was pre-existing. So we replicated some of the interactions to previously known, but we show that there are a lot more interaction within the viral proteome that was previously known. So that, that technology uh, was uh, then further expanded during the, the COVID pandemic. So we with uh, SARS-CoV-2, we uh, looked at the interaction of the virus with SARS-CoV-2, not SARS-CoV-19, um, with uh, uh, human proteins, you know, trying to understand how the virus enters the cells and how the virus subverts the, the cell. And so we started this work. Uh, during the, the COVID, there was a first proteomic study that identified uh, uh, three, oh, over 300 COVID-19 interacting uh, proteins, uh, 62 of which could be potentially targeted by the FDA-approved drugs. And so our job was in a part of the international consortium was to validate which uh, interactions were actually real and which, which were not. And so for that, we had to first make all the proteins of uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, you know, and that's the gel shows that was uh, we successfully could express uh, all of the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, ORFs. And then we expressed the 62 uh, uh, putatively targetable human proteins, either in, in green or uh, tagged with uh, red or green fluorescent proteins. And then we actually went and done the full uh, the full interaction analysis. I'm not going to dwell on it, but you know, I just wanted to show you that uh, uh, it was possible to produce this what we call express proteomes reasonably quickly. Um, and uh, so we you, using that, we we were able to validate more most of the interactions and uh uh we we were able to confirm or in some cases not confirm the interaction that came out of the um uh proteomic studies for the virus and so that, that's published work and it actually was quite instrumental then for looking at uh uh genetic evidence of asian sars-cov-2 like pandemic uh many, many thousand years ago in uh south asia anyway so uh and another application that again you know was uh related to sars cov 2 originated pandemic we uh, were uh, setting up an assay for looking at the interaction of ace ace 2 human receptor with uh receptor binding domain so that which is the crit critical interaction for the viral binding to the cell surface and then viral entry so we're successfully able to produce human uh ace2 receptor and uh, the uh the uh the part of the receptor binding domain of a spark protein in cell free and we showed that they, they they could interact or interact quite well in our assay. Uh, and we also were able to show that uh, the uh, neutralizing antibodies were able to knock down this interaction, basically giving us an assay for analysis of, rapid assay for analysis of uh, putative neutralizing antibodies. Now, I... Uh, We'll switch gears and and talk about uh, another application that we, I, I think is actually quite interesting, uh, where we were used our self-free system to discover anti-inflammatory proteins. Uh, sorry for the misspelling. Um, and so that is actually you know, came out of an interesting observation that uh, uh, 
parasites uh, uh, of on all all domains of lives, but you know specifically of humans. You know, if you have, if you have parasites, parasites actually able like worms, but not only worms, uh, many parasites are able to modulate activity of your immune system. And so this is a, a hookworm, uh, quite a quite nasty looking beast, um, uh, prevalent in many, many uh, less fortunate parts of the world. But the interesting interesting feature of that, uh, of that worm that, uh, and parasitism in general, that prevalence of worm infections is actually exactly the opposite of the autoimmune disease occurrences. So the countries that have worms do not have autoimmune diseases, who have much lower level autoimmune disease. And that is uh, the theory is that, you know, we, our immune system actually co-evolved with parasites. And therefore, when we got rid of the parasites, our immune system became hypersensitive and we started getting higher levels of uh, allergies and various autoimmune diseases. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, you, you would think that it's a joke, but there are actually people with various autoimmune diseases who travel to this part of the world uh, uh, where there is, uh, there, uh, the, the, where you can get infected with parasites and get deliberately infected with parasites because they prefer to have a parasite than have an autoimmune disease. Uh, uh, for, for for people have considered uh, um, possibility of uh, administering uh, hookworms and other parasites just as a therapy, which is while medically effective is problematic from logistic and the regulatory point of view because it's difficult to standardize, difficult to monitor, and it's fairly unpredictable. So it's not our uh, classical. Uh, textbook medicine, but what uh, we decided to do, or our colleagues at James Cook University who worked on that project decided to do, they decided to mine hookworm secretome for factors that modulate the immune system and try to make biologic drugs out of it. Uh, and so that's where, where they uh, contacted us and we established a pipeline where we used transcriptomic data to identify putative secretory proteins. And then we uh, made those proteins in Lishmania cell-free system. So that's, uh, for instance, some um, fluorescence gel loaded by uh, with uh, hookworm proteins tagged with green, green fluorescent protein. And then we set up an assay where we just take the cell-free mixture and inject it into a mouse, like, like literally one milliliter of the translation reaction, and then subject this mouse to an Im immunological challenge. You know, so there was uh, it in, in, induces inflammation in this mouse by uh, injecting caustic uh, agents and creating a artificial model of uh, acute colitis, and then looking. Uh, whether the proteins uh, present in the injected expression system were able to downregulate uh, the immune response. And, you know, I wouldn't be telling the story, but it, wouldn't be, it would be unsuccessful. So if you uh, look carefully at this graph, so, so there is a control, which is just a fluorescent protein by itself, and it's uh, with this gray uh, line on the bottom. So it means that the mice... Uh, once the colitis is induced, they start losing weight. Uh, weight, uh, but several of the uh, of the lysis they actually contain activity that were were able to significantly alleviate uh, the the symptoms of the mouth, and so that uh, how we identify this uh, candidate biologics, anti-inflammatory biologics, and that are now being. Uh, uh, going through it through uh, uh, preclinical development to become uh, a, bio, um, uh, a, ther a therapeutic. Now, just very briefly, one of the problems of sulfur systems that makes uh, difficult to use them is the requirement for deep freezer storage. 
So we store it in liquid form at minus 80. And if somebody asks us for a fossil free system on the other side of the world, we have to, out of Australia, we have to ship like 15 kilos of dry ice and then like a couple of tubes of the lysate, which makes it uh, quite difficult to use. So very recently, our uh, uh, graduate students, Juan, uh, was able to establish a protocol for freeze drying the lysate. So basically uh, freezing it and uh, extracting all the water. So you end up with the with a dry system, which you then can reconstitute in uh, with with water. And so he was show, able to show that such system retained the ability to translate proteins. And it was uh, uh, quite stable for for a couple of for weeks uh, at at room temperature. So that's uh, uh, at four degrees in room at uh, room temperature, which gives gives us the ability to uh, ship this reagent now around the world and and uh, store it for a long time. Now, just some. Um, uh, I, I'll give you a brief summary, and you know, I deliberately may talk reasonably short, but you know, so we can uh, leave time for questions. So I I showed you that the Lishmania cell free uh, system pro rapidly provides high quality male and viral and worm proteins. Uh, I showed you that alpha lysa enables rapid analysis of in interactions among the in vitro produced proteins, and that uh, the Lishmania cell free lies, it can be used in mice to take tests for biological activities. And finally, we were able to de develop, uh, develop a version of Lishmania cell free system that uh, is stable uh, in dry form and room temperature, and therefore should be a lot easier to distribute. And finally, um, many thanks to my lab, to Sergei Murayev, who actually established the system and various people who worked on it, and our, our collaborators from Jane Cook University, and people who give us money. This is uh, our industry research organization in Australia, Stanford Rice pro uh, Program, uh, uh, COVID Response Program funded our uh, COVID project, and so and Park and Elma provided material support uh, for our COVID project. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, oh, I'm doing one time. Yeah, I'm doing, doing okay. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer uh, the questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for the really insightful presentation. Uh, and yeah, so now we can open to the questions from the audience. Does anyone would like to ask a question? Uh, you can send the question either on the chat or just open your microphone. So maybe I'll be the first one to ask. So thank you for your um, very interesting talk, uh, Professor Kira. So I'm particularly interested why uh, there is like a higher uh, aggregation propensity in E. coli and lower in Lishmania. Is this because of uh, more proper folding in Lishmania and like oscillation, or is there any other particular reason? Yeah, so there are two main reasons. You know, one is the speed of translation. So the uh, uh, E. coli translates at higher rate. Uh, so, so you have, you produce more protein in a shorter period of time. So the E. coli will sort of spit out these unfolded proteins in, into the cytosol where they, they uh, have a higher propensity to aggregate. And also there are differences between the prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomes. And uh, eukaryotic ribosome has built-in uh, chaperone activity. So it's much better. It, it works slower and it has uh, better at uh, folding proteins as they produce, so co-folding. Uh, the obviously... Also, the lysate will have, uh, or eukaryotic lysate, and it's not specific to Lishmania, but the same will be true for other eukaryotes, has chaperons. Uh, but we don't know 
how active the chaperone systems in cell free system, uh, cell free uh, environment are. And you know, my guess would be that most of the difference that we observe is due to the differences in translational machinery. That eukaryotic translational machinery is just more adapted for large multi-domain protein compared to the prokaryotic one. Thank you, Professor. Um, how about the truncation? Because I also observed uh, there is truncation in E. coli. So is, is that, um, I assume that is E. coli BL21 PE3, right? So, so sorry. Yeah, so I'm um, quite um, um, interested why there is like a uh, truncation in the proteins in E. coli. Yeah. So so there, there are several reasons, you know, so, so in self, it depends where you, if you're looking at uh, in vivo or in vitro situation, but in, in vitro, this is abortive uh, uh so ab abortive translation. So the ribosome basically mm -hmm. fall, pauses and falls off uh, the message. Uh, and so that uh, part, part of that is, again, you know, high speed of translation. You can try to modulate it. You can artificially uh, slow it down. You can adjust your composition of your amino acids and, you know, and try to deal with that. In in vivo, that is often a, a, a proteolytic process, you know. So the you know endogenous proteases uh, attack uh, misfolded proteins and and cleave them, uh, and also uh, the the uh, there are also uh, situations where you have rare codons. And so the ribosomes are not able to pass them effectively, and uh, the the translation is terminated. So those are kind of the most common uh, uh, reasons for formation of uh, truncated products. So the I, I, I see some questions in the chat. Uh, to to, uh. to to. Yes, okay, sorry, I'll... I can read them. Uh, oh, yeah, please sorry, do. Yeah, because... read them out loud uh, if it's easier. Yeah, so yeah. we have a question from Yurgo on the chat. Thank you for the presentation. For the Leophilized LTE system, were there any experiments conducted to de determine the shelf life of the product? If so, did you observe any variabil variability? <laughs> yeah, so so what we had to do, we had, uh, we, we had to spend quite... A lot of time working out the drying conditions so we we had to identify what is called lyoprotectants uh, many of them are sugars uh, polyethylene glycol that we had to add because you know if you just dry the lysate it, it dies uh, or um, so we and or we were not able to dry a complete complete system only partial system but uh once we had the liar protectants and we, uh, we we worked out the protocol uh there's not a huge variability in the outcomes of drying there is however very var batch to batch variability in the system so we do quite a lot of quality control and uh, uh system system uh, fine tuning uh, before before we dry it, just to make sure that we we have approximately the same performance. Would you? Uh, could you read? Thank yeah. you. Uh, yes, and uh, as Yanke said, everyone is welcome to also open their microphones if you like to ask your question. Uh, but for now, yeah. I'll read the one from Joseph. Uh, also, a thank you for the presentation. And the question is, does your expression systems work well in folding proteins like hemoglobin and insulin? And if there is any research towards this aspect? Uh, we haven't we haven't we haven't worked neither with hemoglobin nor with insulin. Um, so in case of insulin, uh, 
one feature would, that would be critical would be formation of disulfate bonds. Uh, the uh, We do know for a fact that uh, uh, many proteins that we express, particularly the, the, the secretary proteins of hookworms, uh, they are cysteine rich and the, the cysteine bonds are important for their stability. And so the activity strongly suggests that the, the, you know, these bonds formed. And in some cases, we we experimentally demonstrate that. Uh, but, you know, I cannot speak for insulin. Um, you know, that's kind of an interesting question uh, to test, you know, whether, whether you know, particularly if you have good, if we have good biological assays, um, that's an interesting question to, 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 to examine. Great. Uh, thank you. Well, this is something interesting for maybe Joseph, if you're interested also in exploring. And well, so we have now a question from Manuel. Uh, what are the greatest problems that you encounter when working with cell-free expression systems? Yeah, so so the and, and I think you know I sort of glossed over it. I think one thing is important to remember that cell-free systems are inherently much less productive than in vivo system because in the vivo system you, you're dealing with a self-replicating organism that has a cheap feedstock uh when you have self-free system you you kill the organism you sort of salvage the remaining uh, protein uh, protein synthetic machinery so your actual cost of protein goes up significantly and your yields go down so if you were trying to use it for preparative purposes you know that is actually quite difficult like you know it's a great method of producing small amounts of proteins for if you have good assays or you have uh, your your protein has activity but if you're trying to get milligrams or grams of protein you know that's it's not impossible but it's difficult so i probably would would say that uh, the scale up is is challenging so we currently developing an application where we use Lishmania cell free to produce targets for uh, binder selection where we use this proteins to pan libraries using either phage or, or mRNA display. Uh, and so that's uh, so where we can uh, where we're trying to rapidly produce high quality, difficult to express proteins and being able to develop um, antibody or synthetic antibodies against them. So, um, I hope I answered your questions. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, it's something that you know a lot of researchers are interested now in working with cell-free expression systems. So it's really good to know some of the challenges and things people should watch out um, if they're planning to start on this part of research. And yes, so Yanke now has a question also. Yeah, hi, thanks again Please. for your presentation, Carol. And I'm changing tact a little bit here um, and talking more about uh, the li Lyoflies drive, drive free stuff, the, the Lyoflies drive free methods you mentioned later, uh, earlier, sorry. Um, yeah. So basically a lot of the work that from Reclone we're trying to do right now is to make decentralized hubs where it's easier to redistribute reagents, so there isn't an issue of like long supply chains or cold, uh, um, cold chain yeah. storages. Uh, so using a layer of flies method is clearly beneficial for that. Um, yeah. Do you have similar protocols that you could share with the community so that they could also learn how to do this themselves? And also, do you have any other hints and tips for kind of this long-term Kind of storage shipping at room temperature th these kind of um methods that would help especially shipping to um researchers in low middle income countries yeah so we the paper uh that describes this system is in revision for acs synthetic biology so hopefully we'll get a get it out uh reasonably quickly but you know we're happy to share protocols even before uh, before that, it's not not really a secret uh, that we, we would like to keep. Um, look, um, yeah. So, so what we do as a part of our 
a dissemination program we just uh, give away samples at conferences like dry dry dust so we put up a poster and then you know put like pcr tubes with dry down reagent and a qr code that leads to a protocol and so anybody can take it and and, and try it um you know the making the system is, is you know you do need a well-equipped lab and you do need to know what you are doing uh but again you know now having solved the problem of uh, expensive uh, dry ice courier shipment and being able just to drop it in the regular mail yeah. and get it and get it somewhere in in two weeks you know that that of course should be enabling uh also for people in the lower resource area you know i would not immediately recommend everyone uh, set up a production just because you know it is reasonably finicky but you know we are happy to supply in with within reason uh the the, the test reagents to people no, that would be fantastic i mean i think we're, we're trying to push for this you know open and enabling technology so the more resources we can gather and share about this would be incredibly beneficial i think so thank yeah. you we'll definitely look look to tap into that connection with you later on Um, I'll pass it back to Sibeli. Oh, great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, so do we have any more questions from the audience? Well, there were oh, a lot of good seems, questions. Uh, yes, definitely. And one of the things that we wanted to really invite everyone is that to continue the conversation on our Reclon Forum, including Professor Kiro, if you haven't joined yet, uh, you're more than welcome to be with us on our Reclon Forum. Uh, we have a topic for today's uh, community meeting. So it's a great place if you have any comments, suggestions, recommendations, more questions maybe. Uh, that we can also be forwarding to Professor Kiro. And yeah, so here's the topic Thank from you. today's presentation. Thank you so much again for accepting our invitation, especially at a late time. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so now I... Oh, <laughs> great. So now I have uh, some information, uh, general information to share. First, that we have officially opened registrations for our Reclon Symposium. That is happening next month. So next month we don't have uh, our regular meetings, but we have our symposium. So it's going to be uh, a couple of hours of your day full with conversations around communities uh, in um, and talking about different aspects of building scientific communities through open science, communication, education, and collaboration. Uh, so you're all invited uh, to join us. Yanke just shared on the chat the information about the symposium, also a conversation link on our forum, a topic where you can interact with us, and the registration link that is on Zoom. Uh, so please make sure to register. Uh, we're really excited to have you all. We have an amazing lineup of speakers that we're going to be sharing pretty soon on our social channels. Uh, Right now, we are on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Uh, also, another really important topic, we are moving our communications to an official reclone email. Uh, so probably hear back from us from this email. And yeah, I think this is what we have for the moment. Uh, anyone from our community has any events or opportunities they would like to share? Um, I believe, I don't know if this is a connection, uh, Kiro, you know, uh, Rob Spate, I think he was, yes, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he connected with Spelly, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, so, no, I do, I, I do not know Rob very well, yeah, so we, we used, he used to be in office next, next to mine, till, till he moved up in the food chain. Yeah, because he was he was going to join uh, another event that Sibeli ran uh, last month, and I believe he mentioned that there's a, a Symbio Australia conference coming up. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, there is. A, so there are two meetings: one in November fifteenth to seventeenth in Perth, 
um, Synthetic Biology Australia, Australasia, uh, which is a, a big meeting. And then there's a meeting of uh, a Center for Synthetic Biology in, in December. Great. Well, uh, Sibylle's just posted that in chat as well. So I've been Australasia. Yeah. Uh, so she's put that in chat. So again, uh, anyone in the community, if you're interested, um, do join along. We're, we're trying to foster more connections between different communities as well. Um, and we want to leave this space for anyone else in the community to just say, uh, hi, what are they working on? You know, um, just open it up. Uh, great, yes. And well, I think it's also relevant, of course. Uh, in November, we also have uh, the IGM Jamboree, which would be really nice also to have people joining us in Paris. So I'm going to also send a link. Uh, and yeah, but for now, focus on our symposium. We're really excited to have everyone to discuss a bit more on our communities uh, around open science and really hear your insights from around the world. So our work continues meaningful and impactful, uh, just like having these monthly meetings. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you, Professor Ku, for accepting our invitation. I uh, hope everyone has a lovely rest of your week, rest of your months, and we see you next month at our symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you for having me.